everybody. My name is Kyle Hikonen. I am a university lecturer in performing arts here in Theatre Academy and vice director of Arts Equal uh, Research Initiative. Uh, welcome to the Studio at Derelia lecture series organized in collaboration between uh, Open Campus of the University of the Arts Helsinki, uh, Arts Equal Research Initiative, and Theatre Academy's Performing Arts Research Center. Following the open science ideology uh, that aims uh, to make scientific research, data and dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiry, society, amateur or professional, professional this lecture will be video recorded and published on the Art Equal website, just so you know. Um, there will be uh, Tula Jasper and will send a name list Actually, it's around, going it's, it's going already, so please sign up. Uh, for we need to know who have been here. And also there will be a feedback form uh, distributed. Please do uh, uh, fill it out because it is essential for us to get feedback from, from these uh, events. Right. Now, uh, throughout history, artists have been part of the city as they have contributed to the dynamic buzz uh, that keeps culture in the city vibrant. Uh, increasingly, also, cities have started to acknowledge the significance of culture and artistic creativity for cities to be livable, uh, as the World Cities Culture Report from 2015 points out. Culture, says Justin Simmons, chair of the World Cities Culture Forum, and I quote, offers an exponential good return on investment for a global city. It delivers against all urban policy areas with depth and sophistication. But although culture is on the list in cities, it is vulnerable. As budgets tighten, it is often the thing that gets dropped. So we need a paradigm shift in global cities. We need culture at the top table if we are able to build livable, flourishing cities. And to do this, we need evidence and we need leadership. Today, we'll discuss the relationship of art and artists with the public space in cities. Our guest speaker, internationally distinguished art sociologist Pascal Gillen, comes from the Netherlands. He is director of the Research Center Arts in Society at the Groningen University, where he is professor for sociology of art and cultural politics. He is also editor in chief of the book series Art in Society. Gillen has written several books on contemporary art, cultural heritage, and cultural politics. His recent books include, for example, Being an Artist in post his Times, The Murmuring of the Artistic Multitude, Global Art, Politics and post fordism Community Art, The Politics of Trespassing, Teaching Art in the Neoliberal Realm, Realism versus Cynicism, Creativity and Other Fundalisms, and so on and so on. Today's lecture is based on the recent book, Interrupting the City, which uh, is co-edited by Sandra Bax, Pascal Gillen, and Bram uh, Yeva. Please welcome Pascal Gillen. Thank you. Thank you, Kai, uh, for inviting me. My first time in Helsinki. Also, Tula, thank you for organizing uh, this thing and for this beautiful uh, poster. So I'm really part of it. It's uh, nice to uh, uh, be here. I will uh, talk today, uh, because I also will lecture tomorrow, but today I will talk about relationship, as uh, Kai already mentioned, between uh, art, artist work, and, and the city, and how they are uh, connected. Uh, it's based on, um, uh, the lecture is based first on a study I made, a research study I financed by uh, uh, the National Scientific Fund in the Netherlands, uh, what I did for uh, two years it was a kind of pilot research and also a research um, funded by the European Culture Foundation. And it was about um, how, um, in fact, how artists and also broader cultural organizations can uh, develop a kind of civil society in general for Europe. So, and how they uh, make civil actions, etc. That was the research uh, about. And the book uh, to which is, uh, uh, Kai is referring is in a way a result of it. But it is also, like all the books I make, it's a kind of speculative thinking also. It is not really 
based on empirical uh, proof, etc. And that's always the double thing, what I do. I, I work, I'm a sociologist, I'm school-like sociologist, so I do a lot of empirical research. But on the other hand, um, I have sometimes the feeling that especially methodology in sociology closes your down or something like that. And I, have, I need to breathe. And uh, I get a lot of inspiration by artists also, but also in, in more speculative uh, theory. And also, I say this because this is also probably the best introduction to my lecture. It mixes both. Sometimes I play some empirical stuff and then I jump to a uh, much more uh, uh, speculative, utopian thinking. It's what you like, and we can discuss also about this kind of... Uh, yeah, what is this? Merging, merging things uh, later on. Do you understand me well? Yes. Okay, <laughs> because I know I don't understand myself anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's start about... Um, the matter of culture, when you talk about relationship between arts, culture, and for me also important, more and more nowadays, uh, politics, uh, you have immediately huge discussions of what is culture about. And we even had to do a report of, uh, for the Flemish government, because I, I work in the Netherlands, but I live in fact I'm in Belgium and in Antwerp, and I'm, I'm Belgium also. Uh, but uh, we did so, that's also the reason why I often do uh, research also in Belgium and for uh, Belgian governments or city governments uh, in Belgium. And they asked me uh, to do research um, about the value of culture. Just one year after the budget cuts in the Netherlands in, in the cultural field, so it's always tricky as a researcher to uh, to do at that uh, to say yes at that moment because you have to be aware of what do they want when they ask for the value uh, of culture, and it is for this research also related later on uh, to cities that we give a kind of very, I think ordinary definition you all know about what is culture. We use the anthropological uh, definition of culture, so not art. For us, culture is a way of life. Uh, the three cups of coffee I need every morning to get up, that's your way of life, so all the rituals you have, etc. But also, in a deeper meaning, we use this kind of statement that culture is about giving meaning to your own personal life, but also giving meaning to your society in which you live. And that's for me uh, very important. And of course, that's not, not something of us. We uh, borrowed this from Sigmund Freud, says this for example, but also uh, uh, Martin Heidegger has the, the famous frame, Sein zum Tode, eh, when he answers the question, why do we have culture? We have culture because we know, because we know we are going to die. So, and then the question comes, what is this all about, this life? And you try to, uh, this word is for me very important, it comes later on, you try to signify yourself, find meaning for your life and meaning for your environment. But when you have a closer look to um, what cultural actors like artists, but also museums, even uh, education, uh, schools uh, do in, in the cultural field, you in fact see always, coming back, three practices. And we borrowed this from um, Gerd Bista, it's a pedagogue, a philosopher, so maybe some of you uh, know him. Uh, but we transformed his ideas about what is doing education, he's answering, uh, to, uh, in broader sense, to cultural institutions like museums, uh, again, art schools, but also artists, theater, uh, etc. Three functions. First one is socialization. Socialization means in its terms, but also in our terms, we use it in the same way, as bringing people in a social order, or integrating people in a social order, without questioning the social order. This is a very important one. So, for example, my, um, my uh, girlfriend in, in uh, Antwerp lists for integration, and she is doing always this for refuge, refugees, etc. Saying what are the habits, uh, um, how can, do you can uh, get a job, but also what is politeness in, uh, in Antwerp, uh, or in, in Flanders, or in Belgium, etc. So this is uh, the first place of socialization. A lot of cultural actors, like museums, etc., are involved in this process of socialization. It's, it's one of their 
let's say, one of their core business, but even, of course, you know, your parents were also, were also involved in the process of socialization of, your, of yourself. Second very important practice is qualification. And qualification means bringing people not only uh, in a social order, uh, but also bringing people in a, a social hierarchical order. That you say, this is better than that. The whole process of canonization, national canon, etc., art, historical canon, has to do with the process of qualification. But it is also the practice, especially when you teach what you do almost every day, by saying, this is done well, or this is not done so good. Uh, so this is also a process of qualification. And I think it's important uh, for us to mention that even after so-called postmodernism, that there is not a differentiation anymore between high and low culture, uh, that we still do this in a very subjective way. We qualify again and again and again uh, in education, in museums, etc. Only the selection process of who is in the museum, who is not in the museum, is a process of qualification, saying this is important now. This is something which we... Uh, appreciate. So this is a, 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 a second uh, function of of, uh, what, what, uh, of cultural actors, and the last one is for me, especially related to the arts, uh, the most uh, important. It's uh, the process of uh, subjectification. What does it mean for us? Subjectification means this: hitting somebody in the face. It is really confronting somebody uh, with who she or he is at a certain moment. It can be done by a film, can be done by a theater piece, or uh, listening to a kind of music, but it is also done uh, when you, uh, for example, fall in love with somebody, you stick together for three months, and then you start questioning, oh, where am I in this relationship? You start questioning your own identity. That's the process of subjectification. Or when the relationship breaks down, you also have the same questions. So this, this is an important uh, mechanism. For, for us, when you talk about culture and the relationship between culture and the cities, those three functions are very important and come back again and again. And there has to be, in a way also, a kind of, especially between socialization and subjectification, what we call a kind of dialectics. Uh, it is subjectification which starts questioning also the social order. So in that sense, the process of subjectification can ask questions to the process of socialization at a certain moment. But there is a kind of, it is a kind of dialectic relationship in that sense that, uh, of course, you need socialization. You need a social order. Otherwise, you can uh, question nothing. There is a kind, always a kind of measure which uh, culture gives. Maybe this is also uh, yeah, this is also a metaphor I often use. Uh, when culture gives you the measure of life, uh, the three cups of coffee uh, every morning I need. Uh, in fact, subjectification and art since modernity tries to bring in a kind of dismeasure in it again and again. So, and this makes also I think uh, culture vivid on the long on the long run. So, sorry, this is a little bit, was a little bit academic and definitions, etc., and functions, uh, but I think it's uh, yeah, important for me to start from this position uh, about what we understand about culture and what the relationship specifically is, is uh, with the arts when we talk about uh, cities nowadays. Okay, cities. Um, To think about cities, uh, a very inspiring book uh, for me uh, was written in the year when I was born. So for me, it was a real old book, 1970, uh, written by Richard Sennett. Uh, it's called The Uses of Disorder. And here in this book, he, um, he explains, let's say, or he talks about the problems of the city. Uh, and especially how the city is organized uh, nowadays. And he says the biggest problem of how the city is organized that it make it is organized in that way that we never can become an adult. We stay in our adolescence. We stick in a kind of way of behavior like an adolescent that we, for example, 
try to be very principle standard on, on our identity. And we defend it uh, like an ad adolescent uh, does. And Richard Semmet says, maybe very blunt, there are two reasons why this is, uh, why we cannot become any more adults anymore or in our society. It's the, uh, the main reasons are family and community. How we organize our family nowadays and how we organize our communities nowadays, uh, in fact, makes it possible that we never can become a, a, an adult uh, 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 anymore. I go a little bit uh, deeper into this uh, analysis. So the hugest problem, he says, is, is kind of communities. And he means by this uh, uh, homogeneous communities, how they are organized also uh, in the city, in which, in a way, an identity of sameness is cultivated. Identity means also, in fact, uh, sameness uh, in general. And um, he says, the, the, especially the city uh, stimulates this kind of identity because it separates different communities in a kind of rational way. Uh, as already uh, Baron Haussmann organized Paris. What you see is a kind of bird view of, of uh, Paris. I knew Haussmann uh, from this lanes and this very functional uh, mobility, but I didn't know what Richard Zemmer is saying about him, that he also separated, for example, in uh, the city of Paris, social classes. So we made real communities of different layers in society. So you get in the city a kind of segregation. Uh, and this is, in fact, says Richard Sennett, 1970, the hugest problem of our city. I think he has in the back of his mind at that moment New York where he is, is living. Uh, but it's very interesting, when I read this book only, I think a year ago or something, or uh, one half year ago, I immediately, I was thinking that he was talking about nowadays. When I, for example, look at the city of Antwerp, um, you see uh, uh, again the same um, relationships and organization of the city. You can't say that it's really uh, organized in, like a blueprint, like Haussmann intended. Uh, maybe it's, it's grown in a way, in a more organic way like that. But you still see a separate place for Chinese people, Muslims. On one side, you have uh, a recently a green quarter for middle class uh, young families, uh, etc. And there, and you have, uh, of course, a very big in Antwerp uh, Jewish uh, quarter inside the Ehuf, where they uh, all stick together. So you get a, a very interesting separation or segregation also nowadays still uh, of those cities um, like in a way Haussmann uh, planted in the, in the past and even I come to this later when you talk about nowadays about creative industries creative cities uh, I had a lot of discussions with urbanists and architects who had to plan for example in a city where I worked in the Netherlands Tilburg and also Groningen uh, where they plant, for example, a creative district, it's there. It's not there, it's not merged in the city. It, it, they, they make separa uh, separate places uh, for that uh, still. So you still have, even while Hosma was so much criticized the last 30, 40 years, you still have this kind of, how do you say it, tension at least to organize cities uh, in such a kind of functional way with functional differentiation. This is for this function, this is this for this function, and separated uh, segregation of, of, uh, of communities. The title of the book of Richard Sennett, in which he makes this analysis, is, as I said, the uses of disorder. So he tries to explain why we need much more disorder in our city. Uh, he says we need disorder and we need agony. Agony means that you uh, can have uh, discussions with each other without uh, you uh, kill each other. It's kind of it's not antagonistic. It's agonistic, like political philosopher Chantal Mouffe uh, uh, calls it. He says we need to have more 
of this kind of places where there is a kind of disorder. Uh, he even uses, like in 70s, uh, the word anarchy, uh, because this is very important uh, for our cities. Why is it very important? Because otherwise we get this. We get interruption of violence uh, again and again. This is London, I think, six years ago now, something like that, um, where you uh, get this kind of eruptions. We had it also in the, the Banlieue in Paris. Um, we had it in uh, Antwerp. Uh, very interesting. Antwerp has one street where it always happens at a certain moment. It's called it doesn't matter, but it's very interesting. It's, it is the border between the Muslim uh, culture and the white middle class uh, Belgian people, in a way. And it's always on this border, it's one street, uh, where this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, eruptions happens, riots, etc. Every three, four years, we have it like, uh, like that. For me, it's also very interesting, but I come to this later. This Billy Elliot in the front. Mm -hmm. This is this is already a kind of uh, foreseeing of what I want to talk about. The kind of yeah. It, this is not an accident. It is really the creative city together with this kind of uh, kind of violent burst, and they they are let's say the the two sides of the same coin. But I come to this later. What I mean. Uh, uh, by uh, this. Um, also very funny, we had it, are funny, funny, uh, half a year ago in the Netherlands, in The Hague, uh, so that's the uh, administrative capital of, of uh, the Netherlands, and it was in the quarter called Schilderskwartier, that means painter's quarter. So it's, it's very funny also there where you see kind of link between creative industries uh, nowadays, and uh, at least in, in signification, and uh, where you get this kind of uh, violent, very violent uh, riots. So again, Richard Sennett, what does he say? We need much, much more places of disorder where people are, uh, can have a kind of agonistic relationship with each other. Uh, so that means where they are confronted with the, uh, with the other. You can only organize this when you have mixed places in the cities where people accidentally uh, are confronted with each other. Otherwise, you get this. So you have to learn to get a fight with your neighbors, in fact, uh, in, a, in a good sense, in a, in a kind of uh, half-decent, half-decent way. Uh, otherwise, you get this kind of violently uh, eruptions uh, in the city. When you look at this analysis in a more, um, oops, yeah, in a more analytical way, um, you could make a kind of what I call a kind of ideotypical history of cities, but it's not a kind of history in that sense. That uh, yeah, there is a kind of chronology in it, but um, uh, I think nowadays when you look at the city, all those kind of historical uh, time frames are mixed up together, and you can point at certain places in the city which is organized in an old way and other ones in a new way. To do this, to make this kind of analytical frame and to lay this over the analysis of Richard Sennett. I use uh, the book The Uses of Everyday Life of Michel de Certeau. He makes a kind of, I probably a lot of you know, is this kind of kind of opposition between strategy and tactique. Strategy means that you uh, plan something, you write it down, uh, you have meetings with politicians about it, and you make a kind of blueprint, for example, of the city, Hausma. Strategic planning, in a general sense. Tactical means tactical use. Uh, even when the city is strategically planned, a lot of uh, people who uh, live there perform every day the city and use the city in their own way. For example, a square is planned for a market, but the scapers come on. That's tactical use uh, in a very uh, basic way. Uh, I would say. So this is a very important opposition to understand our uses of the city uh, nowadays uh, and, and also 
policy of cities uh, nowadays uh, related to uh, Certo. Another opposition he makes is between place and space. Place is fixed place. You stand here and nobody else, uh, else can stand here or you build a building that's the fixed place. While space is in fact uh, again, the performance of place, again and again, because you use it in another way, you make, in fact, again and again another place. That is, you, uh, in French, it's called as uh, more, uh, enspacement, or something like that. It's again and again making uh, uh, the space. When you cross those uh, oppositions, you get this kind of frame in which you can look again much more analytical uh, to, um, to the analysis of Richard Sennett, and especially you can make, or I made of it, a kind of analysis of how art and artists are related to uh, public life in the city especially, and, and uh, politics. So when you look at uh, the city in the 19th century, you get this Hausmann city, strategically uh, blueprinted, organized with fixed places, and I call this the monumental city. Why the monumental city? Uh, the central place of the artist in this city is the monument. It's the, and, and the interesting is also, it's most of the time the national monument. So in fact, the, the city is not representing itself, it's pre representing the nation state. An artist play an important role in this. But also artists are in monumental buildings, the opera, the museum with those uh, pillars, uh, etc. So they have their, their fixed places where they can do their art uh, in this kind of 19th century uh, city. So strategically uh, organized and fixed places uh, uh, for the art. Probably all know, end of the 1950s, beginning of the 60s, um, the situationists respond to this in Paris. They try to force and uh, break down those kind of rigid uh, structure, uh, structures. So that's why I call it the situationist uh, uh, city. Uh, uh, interesting is for the situationist cities, Everything is fixed in their time. Yeah, the rigid structures also of museums, the rigid structures, hierarchical organized. Think about qualification again uh, of culture uh, in museums, in art schools, uh, etc. And they try, in a tactical sense, walk naked through the streets to try to uh, shift this, uh, this kind of, uh, by this kind of tactical uh, reusing of a strategic, rigid, planned uh, city. So, end of the 50s, 60s, would probably a kind of highlight in uh, 1968 Paris. Uh, uh, this is a kind of, of situation. What for me is interesting is at that moment that um, workers go on the streets uh, students also uh, revolt against the university and they enjoy it in a way their, their, um, their response to a kind of rigid system. Maybe also as a remark for me, I, I, I see also very much kind of institutional critique at that uh, raising at that moment uh, and I see it also institutional critique as a kind of tactical reaction on uh, rigid structures. But anyway, Students enjoy uh, workers um, they come on the, on the street. Uh, it's very interesting. But what is also interesting is what we see that uh, these young students, which are then at that moment in the 60s uh, in the universities and art schools, etc., uh, <laughs> they in a way embrace this kind of situationalist uh, uh, way of, of uh, working and make it in a way uh, a kind of uh, general culture to work in. And that's what we get, I think, in the 80s, but especially in the 90s, what I call the creative city, but I call it also the repressive creative city, and why I will explain uh, later. But for me, the creative city 
uh, starts with li literally the embracement of this kind of liquidity, making liquid the city again. When I grew up in the 80s and I went to a city that was all construction work, uh, the city was literally made uh, liquid. But also when you look at cities now, the function of buildings can change every five years almost. You see a lot of flows of immigrants come in, another flow of course, first, first money, then, then uh, 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 immigrants, etc. So the, the city is in a way made more and more as a space. It's made liquid. Uh, it changes every time. But also our institutions change every five years. It's called change management. Mm -hmm. uh, every five years, another organizational way of organizing uh, our, ourselves is implemented uh, in schools, etc. So everything is made uh, uh, liquid. But what you see is, and this is interesting, uh, that politicians uh, in charge of cities try to bind, in a way, capital to their city, and we all know, of course, Richard Florida, who says, no, your city, uh, and says, we need this kind of creative scenes, creative industries uh, for the economical use uh, uh, of cities. We did a, a very uh, a small research about uh, um, uh, cultural policy plans in the Netherlands of all the communities, so not only cities, but also uh, smaller communities. Uh, we did a kind of scan about those uh, cultural policy plans, I think now it was 2009 that we did it. And uh, the name of Richard Florida was only not in two cultural city plans. So it is an, uh, I, I don't have anything against Richard Florida, but it's very interesting how it is used and how even the small town of Venlo, in which I think live 8,000 people, have a creative uh, uh, scene because they have a brass band yeah. is in it. Yeah. So this is a really cultivated, this kind of idea. For me, it starts, it really also starts as a policy uh, or official policy in the UK. But as in a symbolic way, it really starts when uh, Blair embraces uh, Bono of U2, uh, literally, uh, for the media. That's, that's when the creative industries is taking in, uh, in a way. Very interesting is that in most of the cities, uh, this kind of creative idea and cultivating, building creative districts uh, is uh, promoted very much in the 90s, started in the 90s, um, of the former century by left-wing uh, <coughs> governments, city governments, socialists, most of the time. Blair, but also in the city of Antwerp, uh, it was uh, the socialist mayor who uh, starts to organize a uh, uh, kind of brand of Antwerp also, uh, develop a fashion district, design district uh, uh, in the city. Interesting is what happens in 2000, 2001, 2000. And uh, two, all the so socialist parties are dropped out and we get much more conservative parties instead of them. For example, in, in the city of Antwerp, the mayor is uh, uh, from the, what's, uh, the Nationalist Flemish Alliance. Yeah? So it's a very conservative, it's not a racist party, but it's a very nationalist, conservative Neoliberal also, very interesting mixture always, uh, 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 political uh, party. Uh, interesting is also that those governments, those new conservative governments, also embrace the creative city, but at the same time they uh, improve and stimulate also the control of it. They put cameras in the street, uh, more blue on the street, that means policemen, uh, uh, on the street, and they also try to restrict, for example, zero tolerance for drugs in Antwerp, right? uh, 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 the city in a way. So you have a very strange mixture uh, nowadays, and I say nowadays because I think this is the situation in which we are now, about of uh, uh, creativity, stimulation of creativity in a way, and this repressive Tolerance? I don't know. It is a kind of very repressive operating at, at, uh, at the same time. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, again, I, I mentioned already, this very strategically planned. Uh, the creative district is there. 
only there. Right? So it's, it's kind of blue. So they try to infect, uh, try to buy the capital. I mentioned it already, but they also try to uh, make this space fixed again, in a way, by this strategy. Keep it here, right? on this place, and control it like, uh, like that. Again, this, I think, is the paradoxical, maybe, or con contradictory uh, situation uh, in which we live now. I said I also like to be speculative. What I want to take, uh, talk later on is what could be also a possibility uh, for uh, the city, and especially the relationship of artists, uh, politics, and public space. It's what I, I, a space, sorry, it's what I call uh, the common city. But I come to this later. Um, I forgot something to say about this repressive greater city. Uh, for me, it's also important, also art, they try to give art also a place somewhere. And especially by the definition that we see in the Netherlands at least, that the artist has to become a cultural or artistic entrepreneur. So it's really placed in this kind of creative districts, creative uh, uh, industries uh, uh, space. Anyway, so what we, I want to go back to the situation now. It looks like this. This is Antwerp. This is uh, near to the fashion district. You see the beautiful uh, uh, fashion and you see uh, the army in front of it. Of course, this has to do also with terrorism at this moment, etc. But this is very almost um, surrealistic way when you look at the city and look fashionable people walking in this kind of fashion district and at the same time see those guys who are, are controlling and sometimes shopping it's really it's, a, it's very funny when you see them looking with their guns but anyway this is the kind of paradoxical uh, you know, way I think in, in which your cities are, are uh, organized uh, now so in one way uh, letting people free uh, organize your own place, uh, become a uh, freelancer, and at the same time pushing control more and more uh, in the forefront in this uh, kind of restrictive um, way. Um, and that's what I call repressive liberalism. Uh, and I think this is, um, this also I've, I've made a book about this repressive liberalism, what this is about. Uh, uh, because I think it's a very important global political, macro-sociological uh, uh, evolution in which we get stick more and more. And I try to explain what this is about by three quotes. And I will use only uh, two of them uh, nowadays. One comes from um, Hans Achterhuis. Hans Achterhuis is a Dutch philosopher. And he has written, I don't know if it's translated in English, the book. Um, it's written the book, The Utopia of the Free Market. And one quote goes like this, while governments cut back everywhere and relegate tasks to the market, the supervisors must guard the freedom of that market grow and grow and grow. See a very interesting paradox uh, in this. He explains this also by referring to an um, economical study about healthcare in the Netherlands and how healthcare was organized the last 10 years in the Netherlands. Healthcare was privatized in 2006 by a new law in the Netherlands. And what is very interesting, and there the, the questioning starts, what is very interesting is that the, uh, the part of the GDP which goes to healthcare or went to healthcare in 2005, so the year before the voting of this law, was 7.1%. So 7.1% of the uh, GDP went to healthcare in the Netherlands. In 2008, so after the two years after the voting of this law, it was already 13.3%. Very strange to get privatization of a market, free competition, and the prices rise instead of that they go down. What's happening is the question of Hans, uh, Hans uh, Achterhuis, or what happened at this moment. But it's very interesting, of course, when you know when you give hospitals, surgeons to the free market, make freelancers of them, but also your whole um, uh, um, medicine industry uh, regulated uh, not anymore by state, you have to rise, of course, the control. 
for the quality of this kind of healthcare system. But that they did also in the past. It was centralized control by states. What did they do in the Netherlands? They also privatized the control of the system. And this is very interesting when you do this, you get a competition between a lot of companies who try to control holier than the Pope. And they compete with each other for following the rules, even when there are less rules, but to follow the rules as rigid as possible. Because when you know they controlled you, this kind of private company, you are aware that you get subsidized from the government, for example. They have a kind of quality standard or brand even. You see this not only anymore nowadays in, in the Netherlands in healthcare, you see this also in arts education, uh, uh, schools and, and education in general, universities, etc. I work now 10 years in the, almost 10 years in, in uh, the Netherlands, and I had already seven audits and accreditations. And so it's, a, it's amazing. And the last private company who did the kind of pre-audit, to be sure that we went to the real audit comes, to this company called Control. Because Control is a brand, it means that you control as the best, and you are, again, sure that you get subsidized afterwards. This is a system which, of course, first of all, those private companies cost a lot of money, uh, but uh, they make it also very uh, expensive because this whole control, competition of control of rules, makes it very rigid and make free uh, space uh, very difficult. So now we are more and more in this situation, it's very interesting, that not only artists ask for autonomy and freedom, also surgeons ask it, also my, uh, my neighbor is a lawyer asks it, because they are all in this kind of same, very strange mixed system of what I call liberalism, freedom, organize your own uh, thing, and at the same time a very repressive thing. And they, you have a, a huge tension between those two. It's a kind of very strange uh, friction. Lawrence Lessig, uh, it's the man in the back of, um, uh, of uh, Creative Commons, explains this also for culture in the United States. I just give this, this quote because he says, yeah, it's also going on for culture and it's not only in the Netherlands or in Europe, it's, it's also in the United States that you see this. This did me remember at the book that I read when I was 19 years old, and I didn't understand at all when I read it when I was 19 years old. It was The One Dimensional Man of Herbert Marcus, heavy near Marxist stuff uh, at that moment. Uh, and especially this one phrase, I, I completely did not understand at that moment, but I could understand it after reading uh, those other books. Uh, and he says, under the rule of a repressive whole, liberty can be made in a powerful instrument of domination. See the very strange paradox. Make people on the individual level as free as possible on the individual level, and you have all the tools in your hands to make a kind of totalitarian regime again. Maybe he was too blunt in the 60s uh, to make this statement, but what I want to express by repressive liberalism has to do with this. We see more and more traces in our society and our, uh, how our society is organized, also how our cities are organized uh, nowadays, of this kind of very strange paradox by a uh, mixture of individual freedom, at the same time promoting individual freedom, becoming, uh, for example, freelancer. I will talk tomorrow also about this, but for example, uh, in the Netherlands in 2000, also 2009, only uh, 2,000 people get uh, at that year a fixed contract for life anymore. All the rest is contract based, two years of freelance. So you see enormous push of take your own freedom, become autonomous, uh, take your own responsibility. And at the same time, this kind of huge Competition of control. Again, it's not state control, it's not centralized in the totalitarian regime, what Marcus mentioned, in fact. It's decentralized control. We control each other, and companies control each other. That's, that's the very strange uh, uh, thing in which we are. It's, I call it also rhizomatic control or network control. It's really 
on a horizontal level almost. It's not vertical anymore organized. Anyway, this is the situation which we're in, and we have nice representatives of this system, like uh, Cameron here. And what do they do, especially when uh, these riots break out in London, etc.? They put up the moral finger and they say, Oh, the youth of today, we have to bring in new morals, values for a society, etc. So you get a kind of moralization of this kind of, uh, uh, of problem. And in uh, rather re uh, recently, you get the, uh, what we call the appeal or the question or uh, the claim for what they call people like them, but also mainstream media most of the time. We have to stimulate citizenship. We have to bring in active citizenship. Also, especially innocent, we have to activate our citizens. Also on the EU level, you have a lot of uh, um, um, uh, papers written about this. It starts in 2002, I think, with the Lisbon Treaty, uh, where uh, it said that, for example, education, but also uh, especially education, has to stimulate this kind of active uh, citizenship. What is this about, active citizenship? First of all, citizenship becomes their kind of individual responsibility. It is a kind of uh, saying, you have to take your responsibility, you have to integrate in society uh, 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 as an individual. Second, you have to take your own social responsibility. You have to participate. Participate as a, as a dogma. You have to work for the community as an individual, do good deeds, etc. So in fact, what you get here, a kind of participation fetish. You have to participate uh, uh, in, your, uh, in your society, again, as an, as an individual. In fact, what you get here is a kind of depolitization of, of citizenship. It's a moralization, you have to do, it's your responsibility uh, uh, to do it, but in fact it is not about uh, political rights anymore. So you see that the whole idea of citizenship, about having a right as a citizenship to get, for example, an income, to have free education, etc., uh, uh, is uh, doubted because it is your own responsibility. Just one uh, uh, very uh, basic example, one year ago in the Netherlands, um, as a, you can get not any more a grant of the government as a student. You have to uh, rent uh, the money. So st studying again, going to the university, it's not a democratic thing at all anymore and a right. No, it is your own responsibility to get this rent or not. It's an individualization. It's your moral obligation to study. So it's a completely inversion of, of, of the citizenship promoted by people like, for example, um, Cameron, but also in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, so it's all about socialization. Bringing people in a social order without questioning the social order. Okay, this considering this kind of active citizenship, which is promoted now more and more in the Netherlands, in the UK, uh, on the EU level, uh, and I see it definitely with my uh, mayor in Antwerp, who is asking again and again that uh, citizens um, uh, behave and uh, take the responsibility. Against this, you get also a whole army of sociologists, philosophers, even economists nowadays, who say, no, 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 it's not about morality, and it's not an individual responsibility. Uh, it has to do with structural things, of course, the crisis, and especially uh, what is important, I think, is, is the social and economical uh, inequality, the, the gap between rich and poor. poor. And in a way, they are right, I think. Uh, in that sense, of course, when we see it, also in statistics, uh, and a lot of sociologists are busy with this kind of stuff, when the, the gap between rich and poor grows in a society, also violence grows in a society. Uh, and this kind of riots, you get more and more. So I also already foresee that we 
at least in systems like in the Netherlands of the UK, but also growing in Belgium and, and in France, that we get more and more rights because this gap and at the middle classes disappearing in this uh, in this kind of uh, uh, post welfare state uh, uh, system. Anyway, in a sense, they are right. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, in this kind of analysis, look at structural things, how uh, things are related to each other, especially in social and economical relationship in the society, and it explains more than the debate about moralities <coughs> and values on the individual uh, level. But I think they miss something in their analysis of what they call senseless violence, what that's what it's called in the street, it's senseless violence. Also, this is interesting when you look at this kind of analysis of Cameron or mainstream media, when they talk about senseless violence, it's always, you always have a doubt, what do they mean by this? Is it that they think this violence is senseless or can they self make no sense of this violence? It's a very strange mixture in the discourse about, uh, uh, about this. But what I want to say, there is also a completely other kind of senseless violence, and that's of course senseless violence to the self. Suicide, depression, uh, burnout, etc. And I say this because I think this army of sociologists, like Sigmund Bowman was in the former picture, for example, was a very much uh, defender of this kind of, of vision of this gap, that they miss something. Yeah. Uh, because this is also senseless violence where people cannot make sense of their own life anymore and commit, for example, uh, suicide. But we all know it's, it's, uh, it's almost a folk, folk tale in, 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 in Belgium that uh, um, rich makes not happiness or something like that. Money doesn't make happy in, in, in that sense. And we see this also in statistics. Uh, when the GDP grows above a certain level, also suicide grows. It's a very interesting, especially in Belgium. I don't know why Belgium, but <laughs> anyway, we see it enormously there, the kind of connection, especially more and more women uh, uh, commit suicide. In very women, most of the time, in responsible and very luxury uh, uh, positions. So there is a kind of missing link in uh, this analysis of uh, that the, girl, uh, the gap between rich and poor uh, is the only causal, there is only a causal relationship between this gap and uh, senseless violence, because it does not explain this kind of senseless violence in society. Okay? That you cannot make sense anymore about your life. And of course you could foresee probably all what is then the missing link uh oh, yeah. there it is. It's this. Mm -hmm. It's culture. What's culture about? I mentioned already, it's a kind of huge part you can take with all signs in, and you can grab signs order to signify yourself, giving meaning to yourself. That's culture about. So, when in the society, culture becomes rigid or closed, that people cannot take signs anymore to signify themselves, the only thing what stays out to do is go on the street and fight. For me, violence is always at the border of culture. It is really where you cannot have, or where you don't have any tool anymore to signify yourself. And at the end, you're helpless, and you can do two things. Go on the street, as a collective, or commit suicide, to put it a little bit dramatic. Mm -hmm. But that is, that is the real meaning of it. When you don't have access to culture, you don't have access to sign to signify yourself. That's, that's the uh, most important uh, thing I think culture do. What does art, I think, in the system uh, since modernity, putting again and again new signs in this huge bot of, of, of culture. It is signifying again and again, giving people tools also to signify themselves. What I'm saying is, here is not that it, art will save those poor people in the streets who fight, but on a systematic or systems level, 
it puts in in the culture again and again science and this keeps kind of culture also dynamic and art is not only one which which does this of course this can be also in education it can be also when for example in the cultural heritage field uh, you make an exhibition about the Helsinki people, which you never heard about before, which changes or doubt, makes you doubt about your own uh, identity, etc. So bringing in processes of subjectification is a very important process of filling the bot again and again of, this, uh, uh, of culture with all those uh, uh, sides. So to put it blunt, I think we have to put marks on his head. Mm -hmm. It's not economy which is, or the uh, position uh, between social classes, which in fact um, organizes or structures society, it's culture. It is a whole, this bot with signification, with signs, which signifi uh, significates or gives also meaning to our economy, to our way we trade, how we organize healthcare, how we organize education, etc., etc. So it's in fact, the base or the substructure, as we call it, and not a superstructure culture uh, uh, in a society. Okay, set us all. I want to come to the proposition of my fourth city, the common city. What is, could it be uh, about? And for this, I try to explain what my ideas of what I call communism, communism with an O, so not with a U, because it's very important, I think, when you look at communism with a U and neoliberalism, they are, in fact, the ideological opposition of each other, we all know, in the ideological sense, but they share one frame. They all both see, they both see economy as the base of our society. Uh, so Marx and that shall meet uh, at, at, this, uh, at, this, uh, at this place. Uh, so they see both economy as a as, as substructure. For me, communism stands for seeing culture as a substructure, as the base on which she, uh, we give meaning to our life, meaning to our economy, <coughs> meaning to our political uh, way. What is democracy about? Democracy is culture. It is thinking about how you organize, giving signification to power structures uh, and, and uh, uh, politics. But the common, I know, it's a very fashionable word uh, nowadays, means also not, uh, for me, um, community, when we understand community as homogeneous and harmonious communities. The common stands for fight, again and again. The common is what we call, uh, or, uh, Lawrence Lessig calls uh, like Creative Commons. Um, it's a place where you can get things for free, but not like free beer, but like free speech. So it means it means where you get things, uh, get tools again to be creative, but also to uh, uh, to discuss with each other, uh, etc. And when you give those tools in such a space, of of course, I guarantee you, uh, you have fights, you have discussion again and again. Yeah. Also, the old commons where it comes from, like uh, uh, the forest where ever, everybody could take wood out to, uh, to fight. Of course, you had fights there because he says, no, this tree is for me, no, this tree is for me, and you have to argue. Yeah. So this common place is a very, is a, uh, is a decent place, is an agonistic uh, place in the best. Because there are also a lot of fights, I think, really, in a really, uh, uh, which are really violent. So common is not about community, it's not about harmony, it's a place where you can think, uh, get things for free, but there is a lot of discussion about uh, this. But in fact, we need these commons to keep this whole cultural dynamics, uh, in a <coughs> dynamic uh, sense. And now back to my first statement, or the statement of Richard Sennett. Interesting is when you have such places which are in common and where you have to fight again and again or talk about who you are, what you want, why you want this, uh, etc. Your, your identity is questioned again and again and again. So your identity itself cannot stick anymore in adolescence, but has at least the opportunity to become adults, 
but adult again and again and again. This, this, this becoming is very important, which can be stimulated, I think, by common uh, uh, places. So, in a way, art can feed this descent uh, through a process of, of subjectification. It's a place of subjectification, and uh, what I mean by this is, when you, as an artist, I think still until now, you have to bring in a kind of singular proposition. You have to shout out or bring a very different picture or a different ID. Uh, at that moment, you do something, you bring something singular in society, you have to argue why you do what you do. Or people fight also against you why you do what you do. At that moment, you are cultivating a common place or the commons in, in, in general, by bringing the singularity in, uh, um, in a system. Maybe this is also the reason why common is not community. It's not about, um, it's not about all, uh, people who are all the same or have the same attitudes. No, it is about uh, a kind of bunch of a lot of singularities which come in again and again in this kind of uh, uh, process. And they found a common ground that they let and discuss uh, or fight even uh, uh, with each other. So I think the role in cities uh, is try of, of artists is trying to perform this common again and again and again. And this is really trying to make uh, a, a civil uh, space. So one example we interviewed also uh, in the book Interrupting the City is Sirke uh, Samok. Uh, it's a, a, woman, a woman with beard who organizes already 20 years circus in New York. And what they do is very uh, nice circus for children. It's, it has a kind of political content, what they sometimes, why they're juggling, saying, etc. Uh, but what they, especially what they do is they try to make public parks again. Right? So they occupy parks which are in a way privatized or completely controlled by police and break it open by bringing beautiful nice circus uh, uh, for the city. It's only one example we explain in, in, the, um, in, the, in, in, in the book or, or give in the book. Uh, but for me, it's important not a form. It's not about circus, it's not about visual arts, it's not, but it, uh, it's also not about content even. It's not what they say uh, or the message. Uh, it's not a political message which is important, but it's the place they take uh, at a certain moment which makes their art in a way political without even when you say a kind of uh, make a, a political statement. Of course, you can do this as something else, but it, is, it doesn't have to be. Uh, political to break open uh, cities again. That's it. <laughs> now, there are there any questions? I'm sure there are. <laughs> no, I would like to hear a couple more words about the difference between culture and art. Or do they play some kind of different roles in, in this scenario? Yeah, sure. Um, so, again, culture is for me, let's say, call it like that for the moment. I don't like the word system, but it's a system of signification. It helps to signify yourself. Uh, um, but it, um, when you look how it functions in society, it stands for me for the layers history on which you stand, all the values you have, and it stands more and more for a kind of social order, uh, a measure. And uh, art stands contemporary art, or uh, since modernity, let's say it like that, since the avant-garde. Uh, stands for um, this measure, breaking this open again and again. Of course, they need both. You stand only on tradition, uh, and you have to be aware of your traditions or traditions in general to break them open. Otherwise, it doesn't function. That's why I call it dialectic. 
uh, they need each other, they include each other. Uh, but uh, when you break this dialectic, uh, I think you break the dynamic of a culture and its openness and or its flexibility. Yeah? <laughs> First question over here. Yeah. Um, I have also been very interested and optimistic about this MOOC's concept of agonism and mm -hmm. its basis of disagreement and symbolic mm -hmm. spaces like this. But um, nowadays, when there's so much of this kind of like echo chambers and hate speech and all this, mm -hmm. like heating up in the culture, you might say, I've, I've become, become to kind of wonder, can you? think a little bit on the borderline between this sort of like good disagreement and bad disagreement and what kind of systems we need to kind of yeah. understand what is what and does it necessarily go back into the moral dilemma of what is good and what is bad. Yeah. This is something that yeah. I have been thinking about. Uh, I had to, I'm sorry, I had to explain this more with, with, with the notion of active citizenship and this moralization. So I think uh, what is, uh, what I mean when I say also uh, we need more dissensus in, in general and learn to live with dissensus also, I uh, oppose it, and I did it in my lecture, for, sorry, uh, to consensus. So I think the consensual system is very problematic in that sense that when you try to get a consensus um, or uh, most of the time what we see is that you say what democracy, that's our consensus at least, you immediately exclude in, an, in a moral sense, and that's the moralization, people who don't believe in this kind of this kind of uh, uh, democracy. So at that moment, uh, consensus is excluding uh, uh, and making this kind of very interesting difference between uh, what you mentioned, bad and good, or... Uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's unpleasant to think of good and bad uh, disagreement <laughs> because of... Mm. But a bad, uh, a bad um, disagree oh, sorry, agreement, a bad agreement, or bad disagreement is for me a consensus. Uh, because it really uh, yeah, uh, puts out uh, or makes separate, it's, it's, it's the whole moralization of, uh, um, of George Bush after 9-11 when he starts to talk about the acts of evil. Right? This is kind of moralization of the real, the devil, you can't, you can't do anything, only exclude the devil. That's the only thing what you can do. And that's the base of consensus. <laughs> that's very strange. Let them not people in, in, in this. So that's, yeah, what I think, what is a good disagreement is based on the sense that you can accept that there are people, maybe neighbors, which live completely different, have a completely different opinion, but you let them live and you live next to each other. And, and sometimes, of course, you have discussions about the slaughter of animals, for example, in our city, <laughs> uh, or this kind of uh, discussions. And you have to discuss again and again. And I think this is also very important. Yeah, it's only half answer of your question. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, question over here. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, with your models of the city, and especially the common city that as a yeah, false type, how do you see the city in relationship to the um, new media slash internet communication uh, world? Every, for 20 years, everyone's been saying that the internet is going to be the fantastic things, thing that makes our lives so much better. Now we're finding out, uh, well, it has its problems of its own, like the echo chambers, or also that people are much more, can be much more um, brutal in hate speech on the internet. Mm -hmm. So could the city offer a counterpoint, a physical counterpoint to that? With the creation of spaces for dissent in the physical world. Yeah. 
Thank you for your question, because it does remember that one case in our research, which I, we did for uh, ECF, the European Culture Foundation in Zagreb, and uh, the organization which was the, part of the pilot was called uh, Culture to Common. Uh, and what is interesting, when we went on the spot to do research there, first of all, we saw that Culture to Common doesn't exist. <laughs> it was a kind of trick to get money from <laughs> the UN. <laughs> but it's very interesting how, and of course they exist, they existed on paper, and they existed in a completely different way in which they were organized, which, uh, uh, which was not a base to apply for money. So they organized them like that, just to say, we want to do it like we. And what, what I want to say is what is interesting, in fact, they, they came out of a media center, MAMA it's called in Zagreb, and they copied the whole function of open source, um, um, free access, but I, I mentioned hacking. Uh, There's a whole structure of, of which they knew from the internet, they copied offline in real life. So they organize more and more, it's called independent culture, their whole uh, system of organization, etc. For example, very uh, concrete, uh, uh, when you are a key figure in this, in this cultural scene, you most of the time have not one job at one place, but 10 jobs at 10 places uh, at the same time. Because when one organization drops out, you are still in the other organization. It's a kind of tactical way, tactical way of organizing uh, uh, yourself. So first of all, I see a lot of uh, interesting copying of, of models of the internet, the positive ones, uh, the pink side, let's say it like that, uh, which are very interesting to, to look at how do they function in real life. Uh, but we see more and more, uh, yeah, they really organize the common by that in their city and even broader in Croatia. Uh, um, uh, at this moment, but of course, um, on the other hand, you have, especially on the internet itself, uh, also a huge, enormous capacity of control. Uh, you, you know that you are followed, everything what you do, uh, and registered, uh, everything what you do. What is interesting, at least that we see in Zagreb, is it's interesting, it is not yet copied in real life, this kind of control, because it's almost impossible. Because f physical being at a certain place is still, can, still, can easier escape than your place uh, uh, in the virtual uh, world. And they play with this, uh, to make this, this common or to, to organize uh, 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 themselves. But yeah. I can only answer, I see it very uh, ambivalent, double, it's, it's really, it's, it's delivering freedom, certainly, I think, but it's also delivering uh, enormous possibilities of capacity of, 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 of control. It's, it's a double, uh, oh, again, half an answer, <laughs> that you request, I think. But uh, yeah, I, I see that it can function in, um, as a real uh, inspiring thing to uh, build up other social relationships uh, also, and, and escape routes also uh, <laughs> from classical institutions and, and uh, which are controlled. Mm -hmm. There was a question. Yeah, just one quick comment. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, you talked a lot about uh, identities and subjectification. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, because as you very, very well took it up, I mean, the, the liberal society or the, or the neoliberal uh -huh. society and capitalist economy actually works quite to a great extent sure. on fabricating identities, right? Mm -hmm. So then if, I mean, if the artist is to give new signifiers and new sort of things and new material to people, then doesn't that mean that, you know, the artist actually somehow contributes to this power structure as well. Is that, I mean, if you just give people more things to build their identity upon, then there will also be more, like, possibilities of power control to this. I mean, if it only works through the subject and through the individual. 
then yeah. what, what okay. does the artist actually yeah. do? Does uh, it help maybe, um, the first of all, but I don't know if you don't mean that or if I tackle your question by that. By subjectification, I don't uh, mean at all individualization. Uh, this is, so it's not only subjectification, it's not a process only at the individual level. It also happens for groups, collectives, uh, most of the time even. So it's a collective process of subjectification. Uh, um, you are more hit in the face when a whole group comes in, then, uh, which is, uh, has a different culture than the quarrel with, uh, with your girlfriend or something like that. So it's, it's, that, that's the first thing. So it's not a kind of individual thing. But of course, your question is trickier. <laughs> and it's more for, it doesn't stimulate it, in fact, again, the old capitalist system. And will it not uh, embrace again? Yeah, that's definitely, uh, uh, again, a possibility. I see this also in, in kind of, how do you call it? Conjuncture. I look for the English word. Kind of evolution of, of, of how capitalism evolves. There's a beautiful book written um, of um, Chiapello and uh, Boltanski. It's called The New Spirit of Capitalism. And they, they describe cycles in it, how, it's, how it functions. And that's to do, I come later to this kind of signification. But they describe, for example, started already from Max Weber that. Uh, um, they say, in fact, what is the promise of capitalism? The promise of capitalism is freedom, liber liberalism. <laughs> uh, uh, and you uh, are promised this in a, in a system again and again and again. For example, bureaucracy was the promise for freedom against traditional family bounds uh, in the past. And then, of course, at a certain moment, that's the whole cycle as they describe, bureaucracy becomes so rigid that you have to find escape roads uh, uh, again. And this is what we call, what I will call tomorrow in my lecture, post Fordism. Uh, the response to that, that you organize as a freelancer, individual, signify yourself. And now at this moment, you're at the stage that this postmodern worker is in his own iron cage. Uh, again, because he has to res be responsible for everything, uh, again. And now we are there, so I'm really looking at what will be the next way of signification, identifying uh, yourself. And I see only escape ropes on the collective level. But I can never guarantee, I think, or foresee that that will be also at a certain moment be a kind of... Uh, Capitalist tool again. Capitalism is a very, very clever, very intelligent system, uh, which also has very good sense. I think it organizes things very well. So I don't think there is kind of possible escape. There is only kind of uh, um, yeah, there are possible escapes uh, in, in that sense that you. Uh, Back to Richard Sennett, uh, he says there is one way to get out uh, and is to uh, definancialize your relationships. So this means socialize your relationships. Again, it means by that uh, you can, uh, the only thing what can replace contracts, for example, money relationships, is uh, social relationships. Uh, and you try to uh, avoid as much as possible this kind of uh, uh, capitalization. When you do this as a, as a kind of uh, way of working as an artist, I think you get in the circus also. That's why I also talk about circus. Circus means that you organize in a very hybrid way. It's economy, it's family life together, it's doing creative things, but you do it in a kind of collective. And I think this collective is, and not again community, not uh, so not also not a traditional circus. It has to be open again and again. But I think this is an important thing. And last thing, what I want to say, like artists identifying of bringing signs in, um, I think we have to think really about other models of, of uh, artists, not as an individual author anymore, uh, but as part of of, uh, of a collective uh, uh, sign machine or something like that to avoid this kind of hyper-individualization and uh, etc.
Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. There was no. a question over there for a minute. Yeah. yeah um, there's also a number of other factors that are mentioned in the I find also really compelling uh, mm -hmm. words against this time. Uh, is when he speaks about that time in the 20s and Europe, uh, when, when nationalisms were really strong, mm -hmm. and he uses the example of the painting of Cezanne mm -hmm. as some kind of as a canvas uh, against which the person can meet something that disturbs the eye, mm -hmm. and this just disturbing the eye makes the viewer to understand her or himself as a foreigner, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a foreigner in uh, who is freed from the narrow nationalisms, but this kind of um, alienation or being a stranger feeling. Mm -hmm. In the in in front of the art uh, in front of the artwork, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not only being a kind of harmonious part of the yeah. uh, part of the community art, is, uh, but why I find it also really compelling this idea of uh, the idea of, of in the, uh, his subjectivity that part of the subjectivity includes all the always the sense of being. Yeah, it can be indeed. Yeah. It is. It is at least. Uh, yeah, I, I'm now repeating myself, but it is really what you describe is for me uh, really uh, hitting somebody in the face, and that you at least start thinking about yourself yeah. again. Yeah. And that can be thinking about yourself in the national yes. culture, for example. Yeah. Is this my culture, yeah, so or is this yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. so that you feel alienated in your own culture? Right is indeed a kind of, I think, uh, a function of dismeasuring, mm -hmm. like I call it, or, or that you yeah, get in a completely other way. But again, it is not only for me, uh, I, uh, we easily, and also in my own example, we easily relate this only on the individual level, and it's not only on the individual level, I think. It really yeah, happens on a collective level. Also, this process, everybody who looks to yeah. In at this as uh, right. this exactly. kind of yeah. that speaks of it as a kind of consciousness mm -hmm. of a common foreigners. Like yeah. foreign common foreigners. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, okay. Which book is this? Uh, you know? It's an article okay. about foreigner, being a foreigner. Okay. I'll look it up. Yeah. Yes, um, thank you for your lecture, it was very inspiring. Um, I've been looking at the cultural commons and the, the commons literature. I was wondering, have you, because you're talking about the commons, or have you looked at the, the examples of cultural commons or commons arrangements or frameworks in the city context that you could elaborate on? I have also a follow up question to that. And also, I'm interested in because. Helsinki is one of the places that has a lot of collective actions happening right now in the public space. We have a, a restaurant day. Are you familiar with that? No. <laughs> it, uh, it, uh, it started as a counter initiative to the regulations of the city that we couldn't have a, a street food a truck or even a, a small cafe or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just had a lot of paperwork. Yeah. yeah. So then uh, people started to, a group of people came together and said, okay, we'll do this these collective actions, we're just going to uh, be a uh, bit activists and, uh, and do it, and then the city allowed it. And now it has become an uh, international movement, and it happens both uh, times a year, mm -hmm. at least the uh, restaurant day, that anyone can do a restaurant wherever, okay. and you don't have to have any kinds of uh, kind of um, uh, permits. Yes, exactly. Then there's a cleaning day that started here also. Uh, it's uh, like people uh, want to uh, have a flea market on on the street. Yeah. That was not allowed because yeah. the city said it's, it's not allowed. And then there's urban gardens, uh, guerrilla gardens, mm -hmm. and these boxes, and people come together, have these commons or resources, yeah, 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 natural yeah. resources, and then the activities. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of uh, discussion about commoning activities. This kind of a commoning. It's not. Uh, mm -hmm. 
to describe what you're doing because you take care of this and also you contribute to the public and also there's a, of course a lot of discussion because you're using the public space and, and, and so forth. So I'm just, uh, and it's interesting how these uh, initiatives travel also because for example this cleaning day now is being copied like you said this kind of a copying something from the internet but cleaning day is now happening also in Japan. Mm -hmm. So thinking of in uh, ways of formats and concepts that you could take and bring to your local settings. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking do you have anything about the commons and do you know uh, this commons literature that have you used the concept yourself or the Cultural commons. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we use it definitely for uh, uh, how um, yeah, we, we use it in a very specific sense in the, uh, in the research. Again, for a European Culture Foundation, and like like uh, the Zagreb case, we look at how culture plays a role in the constitution of this kind of commons, and uh, specific because you have. The Commons is constituted also, uh, and special, uh, also that's something else, but also civil space is constituted by a lot of, uh, traditionally by union actions, uh, actions by union, uh, strikes, etc. And uh, it misses uh, a cultural component in, in um, yeah, aspect in that sense that, um, that uh, I'm going to stick in it. Uh, wait. Uh, what we see, at least, and what is interesting, I think, in this kind of also movement, what you see and which pops up everywhere from Japan to until here, is that you see a completely other way of uh, fighting for the commons uh, than was done in the past by unions in a traditional representative way. Yeah, the union which represents its members of a kind of discipline or, uh, or profession. Uh, what you see more and more nowadays is that culture gets involved, and that means for me that uh, that you get a kind of transversal way of organizing things. For example, this gardens or etc. is an interest of all. If you're a worker or if you're middle class, if you're so that's already something which is involved. But also a lot of cultural actions. Uh, like uh, organizing a petition, but what was the cultural dimension in the Zaka, for example? They made a petition on postcards. So everybody, one postcard, and they built a huge wall with those postcards, which is a kind of makes it visual. But this makes it also, it gives a kind of impression for a lot of people who are not related to this kind of specific uh, union or, or etc. So it's going, this is for me interesting, the cultural aspect is, which makes it transfer, uh, uh, transversal, do you say this in English? Yeah. So through a lot of uh, uh, groups and gives it also, there it comes, a kind of um, um, you can recognize it also in Japan that's important for it because of this kind of typical cultural visibility uh, uh, in it. And it gives a very interesting, what we saw, a very interesting mirroring effect. So people mirror this, or organizations mirror this from one place to another. And it has to be, uh, 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 it has to do with this kind of visibility or can be also theater. Uh, one anecdote of Zagreb, which was amazing, they did a kind of quiz on television, a local television, and they uh, invited a lot of uh, politicians for it, and it was about the city uh, which wanted to build a, a, a market somewhere, uh, and it was a little bit Balkan politics, uh, ma mafiosi organized, etc., were private and the public interest came together, etc. And uh, the, they involved a lot of politicians in it to make big show of it. And the, the main prize was that you uh, could get a, a travel ticket to uh, Napoli, where you get meetings and workshops with the mafia. Mm -hmm. That was. <laughs> but this has this only is a kind of because it's a joke. But this it is copied everywhere because the people see how you can put. To, people in the trip, and everybody understands, lower class, higher class, everyone is, and this is a kind of thing, yeah, interesting way how communists organize nowadays, or defended nowadays, and on this kind of transfer uh, level. 
everybody understands a garden, uh, a common garden. So this is also this kind of, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting that in Helsinki now, the city of Helsinki is using this uh, counter movement that they started as a counter movement as an advertisement how the city is uh, lively, creative and lively and they uh, use that market. That's funny. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's already incorporated. That's maybe also related to your question. It yeah. can indeed be incorporated yeah, immediately. But and the other way around, who comes to a laundry day in, in Helsinki? Oh, it has a kind of touristic, uh, I don't know, uh, anyway, but, uh, yeah. Yes, there was that sauna day. Yeah. Sauna day, yeah, 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 but that's, that, yeah. It was actually like internationally, right? Like, maybe yeah, maybe. okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but indeed it can be easily embraced, can be easily incorporated, and also commercialized again. But I, can, I think when you commercialize it, or use it as a kind of national brand or city brand, I think it loses its power in, almost immediately. That will attract consumers and tourists, I think, but it, it, um, um, yeah, it, it, uh, it uses its uh, potency or something like that to construct this common. And you easily can test this by bringing in another decent voice. Mm -hmm. And then immediately you know if you still are in the commons or not. Mm -hmm. I think this is, uh, and, and that, that is what we see as uh, uh, also private companies, but also governments don't like when you bring in this, or okay, give us a possibility to it. We saw it, well, it's nothing to do with the commons, we saw it with our way, way who wants to build something with legal. Mm -hmm. You immediately see, oh no, when it becomes politics, <laughs> Uh, uh, but that's the test for me. That's a test if, if you really can construct a common uh, in a place uh, or not. Yeah, there is the one, one thing that uh, I, I would like to get back to your definition of culture or the idea of culture as an as an uh, dimension of life. Mm -hmm. Do we do we see presentation or what's no, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, well, uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, the, uh, does this mean that you, in fact, you wish to kind of extend the idea of culture also to include the signification of life? It, it kind of requires belief and trust. And, and yes, and, and how do you relate kind of this? How how does culture? <laughs> or art create trust? Who? Uh, that's a difficult one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, that's for me very important. I don't see culture as a dimension of. It mm -hmm. is total life. And it's so, and so it surrounds us. It is, mm -hmm. and it is. This is very important. It's the only thing which can gives us tool to signify what we are and what we are doing. So it is really, it's the symbolic order at all we need, yeah? so in which we live. So it's not a dimension of life, it is life. Yeah, yeah? That's, that's, that's the first, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, important thing. So this said, this means also, also, of course, nationalism, certainly, but also neoliberalism is a culture. Yeah? And so we have cultures of distrust and you have cultures of trust. Uh, so this is the, the first uh, thing. So you have maybe in your eyes bad and good cultures. Right? So it's, it's not that, that's not my point. That everything is culture. That's also why it can be the base. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the base of, of a society. Then trust. I have only very practical um, uh, suggestions. How can you um, make trust in society? Uh, I see the inverse or, or the opposite of um, or the result uh, which makes people um, uh, that they have fear for each other or have fear in, in, in general in society is the whole uh, strange model of competition. Uh, when you bring in competition, it immediately it destroys trust. It's very strange. We see this, for example, with rankings of universities, so you see it on the, 
uh, you see it on uh, the meso level of organizations, but you see it also, for example, I see it in universities, do you get a grant, she not, etc. this kind of competition, this destroys everything and you get indeed a kind of management of distrust yes. in, this, in this organization. So one way on all the levels to put out uh, uh, this kind of fear and uh, uh, distrust is try to uh, deal with competition and try to avoid, in a way, uh, uh, competition. It's, it's a completely, um, it's a myth that competition uh, stimulates quality. It's not. Uh, because uh, it destroys trust and it, it destroys especially exchange of knowledge which makes things better. Uh, th so that's, that's the first thing. So, uh, yeah, we really have to think about uh, 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 systems which have no competition. Again, to my Zagreb case, it's not the ideal world there, of course, certainly not. But for example, it's very interesting, they have, they have developed uh, in Zagreb, uh, this independent culture, their own subsidizing system. And they don't select. What they do is they do an assembly. They come all together, everybody, 500 organizations for all Croatia, and they, in discussion for one week, they decide who gets the subsidies and who not. And they argue with each other and they even help each other. And so you had also a huge competition there, but in a very strange way organized, in which you say it's, the money is for everybody, but we try to say what's mo more worth than uh, something else. You, so you, you, yeah, you make a kind of completely other uh, uh, system than, than competition. That's only one uh, uh, practical thing, but I think this is one, uh, the culture of competition mm -hmm. is very problematic, I, I think, in, the, in, this, in this way. There was a question over here. Yeah, so um, before coming to Helsinki, I lived in Amsterdam for 12 years. I took my whole education there. I'm originally from Denmark, so the Nordic mentality is very mm -hmm. embedded. Um, my experience of uh, the big sort of contradiction between art education and the actual exercising of art as a profession were completely contradictory in its working culture in the sense that competition, as you mentioned it, um, would cause a sort of cannibalism amongst mm -hmm. young artists, especially when I graduated from my BA was uh, was one year before the budget cuts, and there was a shift in mentality where people started feeding on each other, not only as a mentality but also in their working life. That can you come and work for free, and then you will get some you know goodwill or whatever, like slipstream economy or parallel system, which does not work, in my opinion. So I'm very interested in alternatives to the cultural entrepreneurship as it is being promoted in the Netherlands and as we have seemed to accept as the new business model for independent artists. Because I think it fails. Yeah, totally. I think it yeah, yeah, completely sure. de-emancipates the artist as, um, as a citizen, yeah. as a taxpayer, as a, you know, there's something completely Wrong. Yeah, uh, 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 I totally agree. And uh, one of the the problems is that it is also the whole idea of entrepreneurship yeah. is individualizing. Exactly. Uh, again, uh, the artist, but also uh, other professions more and more. It's not only the artists uh, anymore. This. So, what is an alternative? I'm, I'm now I'm doing research about this, but I, I'm not sure if this is the alternative. But there are a lot of alternatives. But the one is what I see more and more popping up as cooperatives. Cooperatives and how they organize themselves. It's only one, and that you are uh, in a cooperative, at least you have to work together uh, in a way of trust. Uh, uh, you have to exclude at a certain level. Uh, uh, competition, uh, etc. But I see a lot of. I don't know. I don't say they are the best things. But I, what I see at least is how people try to organize them um, or find their own autonomy again. I mean, then uh, that they can, yeah, indeed, rule themselves in a, a, an even more and more also in a financial uh, way. 
I give an opposite example of the cooperative. It's V22 in London. Uh, it's an organization called. It's almost the opposite. It's very strange. I'm also very ambivalent to it. But they are on the artists on the stock market. They put it all uh, there. Um, and they they started to collect works. They put it on the stock market. All the the money they get from the stock market, they invest in real estate in the city uh, uh, of London. They buy huge studios of it, and they make their autonomous art again. And so it's a kind of inverse of capitalism, or more, or, or a kind of. This kind of, so there are a lot of systems. I don't say one is better, but you see a lot of experimenting uh, uh, with this. And I think one of the, yeah, okay, I, I, it's again the metaphor, but uh, one of the solutions is the circus. <laughs> and I mean how it's organized. It's very hybrid organized. It's everything uh, together. And that's also what a cooperative is about. It is really thinking about money, also certainly about politics, uh, how, uh, how you organize, and it is about making things, what you like to make, etc. And you have to think it all uh, to become autonomous again and to stay also autonomous in your way uh, of working. So that's always my, my double uh, quote. You have to organize your very heterogeneous to become autonomous again. It is really, you have to... Uh, make you dependent of a lot of parties to find your uh, independence again. For example, uh, very um, uh, specific, you have to, uh, when you are an individual visual artist, it's better not to uh, lend only on the government or only of private collectors, but to have your several sources and make it happen like that, that you have sources of the government subsidizing, but also private money, maybe banks who sponsor you, etc. And you try to bring them all together in a kind of system which works. So then a follow-up question could be, uh, design thinking is sort of, you know, bing, bing at the moment. Design thinking yeah. <laughs> applied to the corporate structure yeah. The, the designer will become the so and so most important thinker to the future as, I don't know, it is seen in 10, 15 years. Then I see an opportunity for the artist as well. But there's a big difference then in how a designer is perceived as someone who is solving problems. The artist is maybe more seen as someone who is, if not causing the problem, then pointing it out. <laughs> yeah. And this is not always very, uh, this is not always popular, but I'm searching for the words to make this relevant because I'm seeking emancipation for the profession, yeah. which I know is a very ambitious yeah. but, uh, let, let, way of framing it. Yeah. Let me elaborate on that and, and uh, to put it blunt, I think uh, uh, an, an artist can never be a problem solver, otherwise he stops to be an artist. Exactly. So it is very important, I think, and otherwise you miss this process, uh, this whole process that's uh, the, uh, about of subjectification. Design thinking is socialization. Yeah, okay. It is putting things in a, in, a, in a model. So it's, it's completely, uh, yeah, it's finding solutions for integration. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, the pro so I think uh, an artist always has to be the badass or something like that in, in, uh, in a society has to kick, has to, uh, uh, otherwise it stops. And also, at that moment, also culture stops, uh, uh, becomes a rigid system. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say that the design thing has, the origin is not being uh, like the, the advanced corporates and, and uh, no, we, yeah, it, but exactly, it, that's no, where sorry? all is rolled. Yes, but I, I just wanted to highlight that the design thinking as a design methodology is not hijacked. Oh, I think it's now hijacked by the corporations and the No, no, no. Thinking. It's invented by corporations. No. You can see the roots of it are coming out of the United States. It's promoted as a real commercial tool. It are courses organized by private companies in design companies. It's invented there. Yeah. So it is, and we copy it now in, in education. In the design research community, I think it's, it's not... Uh, Commercial, uh, unlike, but I think in recent years, I think it has been hijacked by the corporations. But it's a philosophy and an approach um, rather than in 
I would say. I would. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there was a question over there. Well, yeah, I have to say about this. I'm thinking my understanding is also a little bit different. It's more like participating all different sides and finding like common. It's it's kind of this neg negotiation in a way. And then in the end, you're also. To, yeah. you, you want to find solutions in the end, but it's not like... I, I don't want to uh, fight about design thinking, yeah. but uh, <laughs> um, I, I did a little bit, re because it came also in an art school where I worked uh, one year ago, and I did a kind of my research where it comes from, etc. Uh, first of all, it's... Uh, um, it's Florida, I think, where it was invented, and this is immediately commercialized. It's promoted as, as but anyway, that's not the, that, that's not the point. I think at this moment, how I see how it is uh, is uh, taught about in schools, etc., especially at my schools, it's consensus thinking. It's promoting consensus. It is trying to organize consensus. That's the design about. So it's the opposite, again, of the census. It is a completely other way. It is indeed negotiating. It's not saying, not this. That's not design thinking. It is, how, oh, let's talk together. How do we solve this? Not. Well, well uh, my actual question, this hmm? is a comment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's like, um, like, why, why is the, the kind of um, the freelance work or even artist as a, like an entrepreneur? Why do you say it's so bad? Like I'm just <laughs> I, uh, let me finish. Uh, like because um, because when I see like uh, creative entrepreneurs or like musicians or, or different kind of like creative fields or or even in the startup culture, I see that there is a lot of this like like teaching each other and like solving like problems together. It's, it's a lot about this kind of negotiation and teaching each other and like having common like let's say simple stuff like printers or something like you share stuff so that you can all like uh, be more like powerful like these small entities when they come together. Yeah, well, I think that's a fair bit of, that's not for me. Well, First of all, I have nothing against freelancers or entrepreneurs. Even uh, I, I, I work uh, together with a lot of entrepreneurs, in the, and I like entrepreneurs. I like very much the entrepreneurial attitude, also that you dare to take risks, etc. But what I try to say is that it in fact are very weak political animals when they stay on the individual level, and then it becomes, and it's not that they are the problem. It's it's they are. They become very weak in uh, defending themselves. Um, um, yeah, just, just an example: the art school uh, in in, uh, in the Netherlands, where I uh, worked for eight years, uh, I saw a whole evolution that uh, the, the fixed staff with the fixed contract is only now still 20 percent, and all the rest are freelancers. Uh, individuals, they have a very weak position uh, in relationship with the institution. That's that's uh, uh, one thing. Uh, but there is also no collective responsibility anymore for the institution, and this makes the uh, institution also very problematic. So it is not because you are have an entrepreneurial attitude. I like the entrepreneurial attitude. I think it's a, it's a good thing, and I think the best artists I know are all good entrepreneurs, but they are very strong and they can make it on an individual level. But I think it is, uh, it is only for a kind of success uh, uh, later on who can make it on the individual level, I think. So for me it's interesting when you, what you said, that you learn uh, or that you uh, learn, learn that you find ways to uh, organize you much more in a collective sense, that you share things, uh, etc. And most of the time, I see this not happening uh, in the in the um, let's say uh, in, at the status of freelancers because they are always their own competitors. They are always fighting. Also, in a way, even when they work together, they know 
they're in competition with each other, and there, there the, the problem can start, at least. This question here, and then I'm going I just would like to comment that maybe also agonism can be a kind of competition of views in a way, but not have to go back to the design, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. About uh, design being something that puts something in the table, like some sort of proposition of how you would like to organize something. Mm -hmm. And you refer to socialization, which I, coming from sociology, see something as necessarily happening anyway. Yeah. So there are always circumstances that you so socialize yourself into. So, uh, for instance, Chantal's mo Chantal Mouffe's proposition of the symbolic space of agonism is a design proposition. And you can have like these agonistic designs as well as any sort of other designs. So I totally understand why you're frustrated with the concept of this sort of like design thinking that has been appropriated by neoliberalists. I know I don't even know what guys mm -hmm. those are, but uh, maybe you should give it a little bit of uh, yeah, yeah, sure. For <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I, from the I, philosophical <laughs> perspective, coming from sociology, I understood that that I always end with the rant, like everything is crude, and the rant, uh, so I would look. For the, for the solutions from that direction. But the designer is the guy who has to then make the, the decisions and, and give, draft some sort of solution that we have to live for now. And they always like, uh, it's not a very kind of nice job to do because it seldom goes right. You know? I mean that sociologists yeah. have the pri privilege and maybe you also gave the artist the privilege of just uh, pointing to the problem and then leaving and feeling wise of the designers and kind of yeah. <laughs> they have to solve the solution. They have to solve the problem. Activists <laughs> of, often do so. Yeah. And also, there's yeah. a speculative uh, design. There's yeah. typical design practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, also, yeah. <laughs> but <you> I <laughs> <laughs> No, no. But uh, anyway, also, I, I work uh, for, uh, for three, four years uh, together with, for example, so social designers. So I know. Uh, but I know also the mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. Anyway, of course, there are different kinds of design, <laughs> and, and uh, it, uh, I don't want to make this kind of kind of black and white. Uh, yeah, yeah. Definitely uh, uh, not. Uh, but I'm always suspicious when something becomes a fashion. And the, also this design thinking, uh, uh, that's why I did try, but it was not, I, I will come to this later where it was, but I, I, uh, I always get suspicious, I always ask them, where does this come from? Why everybody has to do, and especially it was not design thinking, first it was social design, in, which sounded like me, like, um, as a sociologist, some social design, do you know what you are talking about? Yeah. It's really giving form to society. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it was for me a totalitarian way of, of thinking, but it was not about that uh, anyway, uh, but it was a very strange uh, work. But yeah, it makes me always suspicious. Why do we get now all in this kind of design thing? Why is, it, is this a kind of, and what is it about? And then there are the anecdotes which are happening in the school that said, no, this is, when it's that, help. That they, for example, put in the design uh, thinking furniture. You have a whole business of this, do you know? Mm -hmm. There's uh, balls, etc. And it is, it's called, it's come from the school, you can buy it, you have typical uh, 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 blackboards for them. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's a whole industry around this design thinking. And then you sit there with artists and now we are going to, <laughs> the, oh no, now it stops for me anyway. And it costs much more than the whole design of, <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, that's an anecdote. It's not uh, representative of what can maybe design thinking be. It's, it's maybe also what we make of it. Uh, in the general sense. Let's take a final question. We have three more minutes. Let's take a final question. Then let's continue tomorrow morning. If, if please do join us at nine o'clock over here. We we'll talk about uh, Pascal will continue about hybrid artists and arts pedagogy beyond the art. So this will sort of interlink. The discussion will interlink to what we've been talking yeah, about. We'll talk a little about free. There was a question here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <good. clears throat>
Well, maybe this, uh, comes a little bit late as a question, but you mentioned just briefly at one moment, uh, you said potentiality. And um, I don't know um, if you are familiar, but Agamben developed a lot of this discourse and also about the violence and how the violence expresses itself because there is a lack of potentiality. And when you spoke or described the city as a becoming functional, uh, I see this, or my understanding is that it kills the, on one hand, the functionality of the city is supposed to make everything work better, but then in the eyes of, uh, or in the reading of Agamben, it kills the potentiality. The potentiality, yeah. and I don't know yeah. in your, if you have some things about that and uh, in the yeah. city of potentiality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can only confirm it as I, yeah. I don't understand always Agamben, but anyway, it's for me a very, uh, I read a lot of Italian philosophers like Fierno, etc. and Agamben is always this trinity and this, this, uh, <laughs> this religious thing in it I knew. Uh, but anyway, um, I, on, I think I understand very well what he means by potentiality. And uh, it is the, the uh, the not yet to become, or something like that, which is very important. And uh, so when I talk about the common, and maybe this is the hidden agenda I have in my head, is this potentiality, this keeping open, or when I say keeping open culture, but filling up with science again, uh, you can do this only by the census. This, so I think I take Rossier at one side, <laughs> and Agamben at the other side, and I say you have to, uh, <laughs> Uh, organize the census to keep uh, potentiality alive or something like that. So it is, for me, I see this kind of relationship uh, uh, between two. And by organizing indeed things functional, etc., we are, because we are also afraid of potentiality, of course, uh, because it can, oh, potentiality can, uh, it's not uh, good, eh? can be good or bad what comes out of the potentiality or following a gamble. So uh, it is something where we also are afraid uh, about, especially policy makers in charge of, of, uh, of cities, etc. I don't know if you want more. <laughs> if I have to elaborate more. <laughs> no, no, but, but so yes, I, uh, as I understand, as I understand uh, again, I read it like that. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Pascal. Thank you for the audience for uh, generous participation. Very talkative, I must say. Considering that we have a Finnish audience, well, and, and, and sorry, sorry again about my blunt statements about design. I never want to see this on camera. I think it's, it's really sorry. It was not my intention at all. Uh,